Dusk on Mother's Day, May 1999. A lone car makes its way north from Adelaide through the desolate salt plains, heading for the tiny wheat farming village of Snowtown, 150 kilometres away. 24-year-old David Johnson is accompanying his stepbrother, 19-year-old Jamie Vlasakis. David believes Jamie is taking him to pick up a cheap computer. It's nightfall as they drive into Snowtown, a sleepy village with a population of just a couple of hundred. They pull up in Railway Terrace, outside an old brick building, once used as a bank. Eagerly, David Johnson is about to go with Jamie Vlasakis through a side door, unaware of the horror awaiting him. Where is it? It's there. David Johnson will be the final victim in one of the most shocking and gruesome series of murders in the annals of Australian crime. It'll be another two weeks before police converge on this disused former bank and what they find will not only horrify them but give the isolated rural community of Snowtown an international reputation for all the wrong reasons. Adelaide, Australia's so-called City of Churches, a town that has been meticulously planned from its inception. But like all Australian urban centres, it's had to succumb to the realities of 20th century life as a suburban sprawl of low-cost government housing begins to spread north of the city. Here, unemployment is high and prospects are bleak in these tracks of look-alike prefabricated houses they become a breeding ground for disillusionment, despair, and inevitably crime. One of the residents is teenager Clinton Trezise. Clinton's endured a difficult family life, having lived most of his younger years in foster homes. But despite the hardships, he's grown into a carefree, independent, likeable young man with a flamboyant taste in clothes and a happy-go-lucky attitude. As much as he had an independent spirit, he still had a vulnerability about him. Um, I remember when he got the unit on Phillip Highway, he was ecstatic. He was so excited to be living on his own. Among the locals who befriend Clinton Trussais are Barry Lane and Robert Wagner. But he's unaware that they're members of a group of social misfits whose leader is a dangerous psychopath. In August 1992, he's invited to a house in Waterloo Corner Road in the Adelaide suburb of Salisbury North. Clinton is sitting in the lounge room when he's suddenly attacked from behind. He fell to the ground and was struck repeatedly to the back of the skull. It fractured the back of his skull and the force of the blows was so great that the front of his skull, which had been up against the floor, was also fractured. You made a mess of my garment! The killer then summons his mates, Robert Wagner and Barry Lane, who live nearby. They drive north into the country and dig a shallow grave on a farm. Clinton's sister, Cherie, attempts to file a missing person report with the police. I think I went to Elizabeth, I can't remember, and said, look, my brother's gone missing. Um, we haven't seen him for a couple of weeks. We've had no contact with him. We can't reach him. Um, his place is a mess and it's more than usual. It, wa it was more than usual when we had a proper look. Um, I need to file a missing person's report. I just thought he got a jack of all the shit that was going on in his life and decided that he was better off away from it all and picked up and moved away. I just thought he'd gone through a different change of life. Despite Cherie's claim, inexplicably, no missing persons report on Trezise is filed until his mother files one, three years later. It will also be some years before the remains of Clinton Trezise are found, and even longer before they're finally identified, along with many other victims. The killer is a psychopath named John Bunting, 
a stocky man in his mid-twenties. He's a cruel and malevolent monster who lives with his illiterate and partially blind wife, Veronica, in the house at Waterloo Corner Road, Salisbury North. One of the things he would do as a youngster is grab all sorts of different chemicals and drop insects into them and watch them die in pain. He would dig tunnels under his home until his dad told him it was too dangerous and made him stop. As a teenager, he got into Nazism. The one unifying factor all the way through his story is the fact that he had a, um, a terrible hatred of gays and pedophiles and he didn't seem to distinguish between the two. It's at the house in Waterloo Corner Road that Bunting first meets his neighbours, Robert Wagner and Barry Lane, and draws them into his evil web. Wagner was another troubled uh, kid who grew up in um, the northern suburbs of Adelaide. Uh, he was uh, illiterate and um, always in, in uh, having problems at school. He also had problems on, on the home front. His uh, stepdad used to, uh, was a very strict disciplinarian, used to beat him. He met up with um, a character called Barry Lane, who was a, um, a gay man and cross-dresser, uh, also in, um, like to be known as Vanessa, um, who hung around in the, um, in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. And basically Lane began a relationship with Wagner, who was at this, at this stage still uh, uh, almost a preteen, he was 13 or so at the time. Wagner and Lane become frequent visitors to Bunting's house, as does another friend, Mark Hayden, a man of few words, who's also fallen under Bunting's evil influence. All are fascinated by John Bunting's sick obsession with cruelty and vengeance. 16th of August, 1994 and two farmers make a gruesome discovery here at Lower Light, 50 kilometres north of Adelaide. A shattered human skull and other skeletal remains. Police can't identify the body. It's been two years since Clinton Trezizer's murder and it'll be another five years before he's finally identified. I hope to God he died instantly, but I don't know if he did or whether he just went Unconscious. All I can picture is my innocent brother sitting on a couch. So the war on coming up and going whack, on the back of his head, going what? So, um... By the time that Clinton Trezizer's remains are found in 1994. John Bunting has gathered around him a larger group of social outcasts. One of these is Elizabeth Harvey, who'd separated from her husband, Marcus Johnson. Well, you can call me Uncle John if you want. She's moved in is with Bunting correct? at Waterloo Maybe. Corner Road, bringing with her her two sons from previous marriages, Troy Ewd and Jamie Vlasakis. Her son's stepfather, Marcus Johnson, recalls meeting Bunting. He was not interested in sport. He had no hobbies. It just seemed as if the sun rose and the sun set on pedophilias. And that was virtually all he would discuss. Both Jamie and Troy have been sexually abused as children by Jamie's birth father. And Troy, in turn, has sexually abused the younger Jamie. Jamie Vlasakis is soon under the control of Bunting. In a rented caravan not far from the Waterloo Corner Roadhouse lives an intellectually disabled pensioner, 26-year-old Ray Davies. One day in 1995, Davies' landlady, Suzanne Allen, confronts him at the caravan. You come back here, you she accuses him of molesting a child she knows. He protests his innocence, but Suzanne Allen goes off to report him to police. She then tells her neighbour, John Bunting. It's all the excuse the murderer needs to justify his urge to torture and kill. I didn't do anything! He was captured, overpowered by Wagner and Bunting. He was bound and thrown into the boot of a car, taken into bushland and beaten before he was taken back to Bunting's house. 
There he was tortured further before he was strangled to death with some jumper leads from a, that would be used to start a car. <laughs> Also present is Elizabeth Harvey, who's convinced Davies is a pedophile. Bunting took advantage of this and goaded her into taking part in the assault. <laughs> she picked up a ceramic tool and stabbed Davies in the leg. His body was then dumped in the back in a hole in the backyard of 203. Nobody seems to care how or why Ray Davies has disappeared. He's not reported missing. <laughs> Suzanne Allen has become obsessed with bunting, and they begin a sexual relationship. Despite the fact that he's not only married to Veronica, but is also having an affair with Elizabeth Harvey. Suzanne Allen's constant sexual advances are annoying bunting. It's a fatal obsession. In November 1996, Suzanne Allen simply disappears. After her family reports her sudden and mysterious disappearance, police go to Suzanne Allen's home and are disturbed by what they find. Her place, which was normally uh, quite neat and tidy, was uh, pretty much trashed. And more concerning was the fact that her pets were there and she was a, uh, a keen animal lover and would never leave her pets alone. But Bunting and Wagner know exactly where she is. Her body was dismembered, parts put in uh, rubbish bags, and eventually she was buried in the back yard of that home in uh, Waterloo Corner Road at Salisbury North where John Bunting lived. There's no direct evidence of foul play, so Suzanne Allen is simply declared a missing person. Bunting and Wagner will Susie. later claim they found Suzanne dead from Susie. a heart attack and that they only dismembered and hid her body so that they could collect her social security payments. We'll uh, come back for her, mate. On Suze, eh? The tangled web of relationships around John Bunting is complicated. In 1996, Bunting and Elizabeth Harvey and her two teenage sons, Troy and Jamie, move to live in a house in the town of Murray Bridge, around 100 kilometres away. But he keeps in contact with Wagner. Bunting and Wagner are now on a roll, driven by greed and an irresistible bloodlust. Bunting constructs a chart that he refers to as the Wall of Spiders. It's a list of potential victims, various acquaintances that in some strange delusion he decides are all child molesters. He often picks out a name at random, then calls and abuses them. You pedophile! I don't care who you call, mate! Call who you want! We'll meet though, won't we? you find out real soon! At the centre of the chart is the convicted sex offender, Barry Lane, his accomplice in the disposal of Clinton Trezizer's body. By the spring of 1997, Bunting decides it's time to kill again. Michael Gardner is a flamboyant and openly gay man. He too has had a troubled life. His stepfather resented him because of his sexual orientation and after being sexually abused by a family friend when he was 14, he was put in foster care. Now, at age 19, he's coming to terms with life and he rents a room in a house near Robert Wagner's home in Northern Adelaide. Michael's landlady is Nicole Zarita. I used to colour his fingernails for him and, and he used to wear a wig and call him Michelle and. You know, he let him be who he wanted to be and, and not feel inhibited. Nicole Zarita's cousin, Vicky Mills, lives nearby and she's having an affair with Robert Wagner. So Michael Gardner soon gets to know them. One day, an incident involving one of Mills's children sparks Wagner and Vicky Mills into a rage. 
uh, they came home to discover um, Michael Gardner chasing an excited kid round the round the room, all very fun. Uh, except that when Gardner grabbed the kid, uh, he accidentally put his hand over the kid's mouth, and this was seen as a uh, uh, a sinister move by both uh, Mills and Wagner. When Michael's landlady, Nicole Zarita, goes on holidays soon afterwards, Wagner links up with Bunting and they attack. Michael is abducted and taken to a shed at the back of Bunting's house in Murray Bridge. He's tied up, tortured. Hold him up, bro. Hold him up. And strangled. Hold him up. Hold him up. Hold him up. Dirty son of a bitch. You're a homosexual, aren't you, mate? You dirty little mongrel. As he's falling to his knees, Bunting demands that he stands up. Go, go, go. Hold him up. The knot is getting tighter. No, but, oh, yeah, easy, easy tiger. Michael Gardner struggles ineffectually in his final moments. You feel the pain? You feel the pain? Look in my eyes! His attackers will later hack off his limbs and throw his body parts into an acid-filled barrel in the shed. Mate, that was intense, wasn't it? Come on, quick, we'll find his body wallet. Bunting and Wagner ransack Zarita's house, searching unsuccessfully for Michael's wallet in the hope of obtaining his bank and ID details to access his benefits. They take all his belongings and steal some of hers to make it look as if he'd robbed her and run away. Nicole Zarita later finds Michael's wallet in the room under his bed. Then I started to get um, phone calls at my house um, from somebody saying he was Michael's friend and um, Michael needed his ID because he they, Michael's wallet was oh, under the bed stuff, in the room that he stayed in. I just want Michael to come and give me And my um, Jamie had known that, that I had that because Jamie had been around and I, you know, told him got his wallet, so um, he hasn't got his social security card or anything. And um, they wanted that. And I said to this um, friend, I said, yeah, and I want my stuff, so Michael better come and see me. And... Um, then I got another phone call um, saying, you know, he really needs his ID. Can you meet me in the park and give it to me? And I'm like, I don't think so. More no, threatening calls follow, in, including one. one from someone claiming to be Michael. Nicole dismisses them, but eventually no, she's convinced it. by Jamie to hand the wallet over. She remains concerned for her border's whereabouts. Alarm bells about Michael's disappearance fade away. John Bunting has only ever tolerated Barry Lane because he was having a relationship with his partner in crime, Robert Wagner. But now, that's over. Barry Lane has taken up with a new lover, Thomas Trevelyan, a mentally disturbed teenager fond of all things military. Bunting also knows Lane has been talking. To Bunting, the ever-expanding network of alleged pedophiles seems to have one common denominator, the convicted sex offender Barry Lane. Bunting hasn't forgotten how Lane told Veronica of Trezise's murder, and now he's fair game. Barry Lane's time is up. The killer is getting more devious. In the next attack, he will force his victim to make a tape recording and a phone call to explain his sudden disappearance in case there are questions asked by relatives or police. On the bed, you On the bed! Shut up! Shut up! Bunting, Wagner and Thomas Trevelyan went to Lane's house. They burst in on him and subdued him and tortured him and forced him to make a phone call to his mother in Adelaide Hi, Mom. What's she say? Lovely, your mom, isn't she? Right? to basically ring up and abuse her and put her off the set. I'm moving to Queensland. After this call was finished, Bunting, Wagner and Trevelyan then renewed the assault on Lane. We're at my nursery on time. They used pliers to crush his toes and toenails. Some sort of warped experiment to see which was more painful. Uh, they beat him up 
and they finally, uh, after gaining his financial details, they then strangled him. Hey Rob, finish that trick, finish him! Uncle Fester, I'll call him! Uncle Fester, the child molester! Mm -hmm. You got right there, Rob? I'm out there, I'm just so mad. I'm smart, I'm smart! Uncle Fester! Hey! Hey! His body was wrapped in a carpet and left in the house for a number of days before being removed and taken away um, and dismembered and put in a barrel. Ten days after his disappearance, a female friend of Lane's reports him missing. She tells police that Lane has spoken to her about Clinton Trezizer's death. She's sceptical, but she passes the story on to police. But because of the bogus tape recording, police believe Lane has moved to Queensland. Meanwhile, 19 years old Thomas Trevelyan has every reason to be terrified. By late 1997, five people have died in the northern suburbs of Adelaide and in the town of Murray Bridge in South Australia. Hold him up! Hold him up! <laughs> Their bodies lie secretly buried, dismembered and stuffed into barrels of acid. Only the killers know of the hideous fate of Clinton Trezai's, Ray Davies, Suzanne Allen, Michael Gardner and Barry Lane. Following Lane's murder, Thomas Trevelyan moves in with killer Robert Wagner and his girlfriend, Vicky Mills. Yeah. Is that yeah. nah. Trevelyan is mentally unstable and emotionally erratic, and he's obsessed with all things military. He soon confides in a cousin that he's been involved in Lane's murder and that he's now concerned for his own safety. They strongly believed that sooner than later, Trevelyan will tell someone about what had happened. In their view, Thomas Trevelyan had to die. They take advantage of his troubled background and stage a suicide. Blakey, you told everyone why! Take him up, bro! Take him up, bro! Sorry! Die! Die, you son of a bitch! You spilled the pig! Hey! He's found hanging from a tree in the Adelaide Hills. For some years, police believe he's killed himself. By early 1998, Jamie Vlasakis is still living in John Bunting's house, along with his mother, Elizabeth Harvey. By this time, he's become a heroin addict, and he invites a fellow addict, Gavin Porter, to move in. It's a dangerous decision because Bunting has now added drug addicts to his bizarre hate list. While he excuses his protege Jamie's heroin use, he despises Gavin Porter for being a junkie. Gavin is a schizophrenic on a pension, and Bunting soon gets his bank details and PIN number. When Bunting accidentally pricks himself on a needle that Porter has left on the couch, he flies into rage and decides that Porter will be victim number seven. And so when Jamie's away one day, the familiar murder ritual is played out. Oh, Jesus Christ, the master's waking up! It's understood that while Porter is sleeping in the back of a car, Wagner and Bunting strike. After being beaten, tortured and finally murdered, Porter's body is put in a barrel and stored in the garage at the back of the house in Murray Bridge. When Jamie Lasakis returns to the house, Bunting takes him to the shed. There, to his horror, he sees the murdered body of his mate Gavin. His shock is doubled minutes later when Bunting points to a barrel, lifts the lid, showing him the remains of Barry Lane and Michael Gardner. Oh, Barry and Michael Gardner, isn't it? Hello? Oh, you screwed up, John. Jamie is repulsed and violently ill, but he's so frightened he agrees to go along with Bunting's plans, including accessing Gavin Porter's social security payments. I'm just ridding the world of a few bad, bad seats, that's about it. 
By August of 1998, Bunting decides that it's time for the impressionable Jamie to have his first taste of murder. He convinces the young man that his older half-brother, Troy, deserves to be punished for having sexually abused him. Armed with makeshift clubs and jack handles, they enter Troy's bedroom. The group drags him to the bathroom and tape records his voice. You help us out here, mate. Want you to say a few things from your eyes? The repulsive recordings of this horrifying torture and murder will later become known going to birth. as the voices of the dead. Because you're not. You're not going to birth, mate, are you? You're staying here with us. Spin it around, Rob. Piece of shit. Hurry up, Rob. It's taking too long. Have a go, you son. Come on, boy. Have a go, Jamie. <laughs> Finish him, Rob! Finish him! <laughs> Life is fading for Troy. Wagner ensures he loses consciousness. Bunting is exuberant, on a high, loving it. <laughs> With Troy's lifeless body lying slumped on the floor, Bunting orders Jamie to kick it. And then to help dump the body in the shed. With three victims now out there in barrels, the stench is becoming overpowering. Jamie is sick and terrified, but has no qualms about accessing his dead brother's social security benefits to buy drugs. There are now eight people dead, and there's still nothing to stop the killing spree. Apart from the unsolved murder of the still unidentified Clinton Trezise, all police have are a couple of missing persons reports and they're investigating a number of suspect social security frauds. Like sharks in a frenzy, this is a gang that's out of control and will readily feed on its own, as Mark Hayden is about to find out. Hayden is married to Elizabeth Sinclair and Bunting takes a real dislike to her for the flimsiest of reasons. He decides he'll deal with her later. But in the meantime, Bunting targets Elizabeth Sinclair's 18-year-old nephew, Fred Brooks. The teenager must die, simply because he's an easy target. The manipulative Bunting is determined that young Jamie will continue to play a part in this terrible nightmare. It's September 1998, only a month after Troy's murder. The attack on uh, Fred Brooks lasted a number of hours and was severe, if not shocking, uh, in its brutality. He was uh, stripped and beaten. He had lit cigarettes um, placed in his nose and ear. He had a cigarette lighter was used to burn a smile or a smiley in his forehead. Uh, the um, cigarette lighter was then used to burn his nipple. Bunting at one point brought out a machine called a Variac machine, which was uh, used for um, lead or nickel plating, I believe. The machine was attached to alligator clips, which were then attached to Brooks's genital region. later point after that had finished, Bunting produced uh, some sparklers. Brooks was still restrained at this point. Bunting split open the, uh, the sparkler and inserted one end into Brooks's penis, uh, used a lighter to set fire to the sparkler and watched it burn down to the base, um, even while um, Brooks was um, squirming to try and get away. And this apparently amused Bunting and Wagner uh, so much that they did it again with a second sparkler and, and did the same thing. Yeah. One of the final things that was done was that uh, Bunting and Wagner used uh, syringes to inject water into um, Brooks's testicles, and at, that, and at a later point, sometime after that, um, Brooks mercifully uh, passed away.
Uh, Brooks's body was um, later taken to Mark Hayden's house at um, Smithfield Plains, in North, that's in the northern suburbs of Adelaide, whereby now the other barrels had been taken for storage. And subsequent to this time, um, Brooks's Centrelink benefits were then accessed by the murder gang. Now the madness grows, the torture more extreme, the selection of victims becoming more random. Just a few weeks later, in October 1998, Bunting and Jamie Vlasakis are sitting in a car in Murray Bridge when they spot 29-year-old Gary O'Dwyer hobbling across the road. O'Dwyer was the victim of a shocking car accident, leaving him to survive on a disability pension. He's easy prey, and Bunting contrives to get them invited to O'Dwyer's house. Uh, they were all sitting around the lounge room having drinks when suddenly Bunting stood up, and uh, it was almost like a signal, and Wagner grabbed O'Dwyer from behind and began to um, uh, choke him. Stop, mate, you're killing him. <laughs> Bunting at the time said, stop, you're killing him, without a trace of irony. Um, they proceeded to beat O'Dwyer up to use various torches that had also been used previously, uh, including the Variac machine that had been used on Fred Brooks. They elicited um, O'Dwyer's financial details from him so they could access his accounts and uh, recorded his voice in the same way that they had uh, recorded Fred Brooks and Troy Ude. Uh, making statements uh, to try and put off their families. Kill him, Rob. Kill him. And finally, um, O'Dwyer was strangled at his house on Francis Street. Death number 10, and another dismembered body ends up in a barrel. Now that O'Dwyer's out of the way, somewhere in the dark recesses of his warped mind, Bunting decides it's time for his accomplice's wife, Elizabeth Hayden, to die. But it's her callous murder that will give police a key lead and fuel their fears that this is a case of serial killings. By May 1999, Detectives are closing in on the gang of killers, but they still have no idea of the enormity of their crimes. Incredibly, in the midst of all the police phone taps and constant surveillance, the gang claims its 12th victim, 24-year-old David Johnson. In Snowtown, detectives from Adelaide tell local constable Ian Young about their search for the Land Cruiser. I pulled my notebook out and I said, oh, yes, I can tell you where that is and uh, I'd explained to them that it actually had come into the town uh, back in either late January early February and it actually was loaded with um, um, some barrels in the back of this vehicle and uh, that's when they pricked their ears up and uh, the investigation went on from there. The detectives locate the Land Cruiser at the couple's house and find out that John Bunting is renting a disused bank building in the town. When they went over to the bank, they let themselves in through the side door, pushed through to the bank vault, and opened the bank vault. When they pushed through the plastic, they were hit with a foul stench, which they immediately believed was the smell of dead bodies. The horrified officers immediately called for reinforcements and special equipment. A few hours later, in the early evening of May 20th, they went back inside the vault, one police officer opened the lid of each barrel in turn. Another officer who was carrying a video camera then pointed the camera inside each barrel to document what was inside. Police today confirmed there were eight victims in the plastic barrels found in a disused bank at Snowtown in South Australia's mid-north. People didn't believe it. Not in a small town like Snowtown. The smell had actually, because the vault door had been opened, the smell had actually gone right through the bank. It was days later that I can actually recall driving down the main street and seeing people coming into the town 
even media people down on their hands and knees trying to smell underneath the door and also the chute at the side of the bank where I will put mail into the bank. They are actually putting their nose in there to see if they could smell anything. The barrels are then taken to Adelaide where Professor of Anatomy at the University of Adelaide, Marchi Hennenberg, is called in to assist in the identification. I was shocked by the cruelty with which those uh, crimes were perpetrated. Because it takes an enormously callous human being to be able to dismember a body of another human being as if it was an object. Ugly as the discovery was, the dismembering and storage of the bodies is part of a behaviour pattern in serial killers when murder alone can't gratify their sick urges. Criminologist Alan Perry has studied this. Now that no longer satisfies them, so they have to take it, they have to take it steps further. Those steps frequently involve sort of um, torturing the victims, dismembering the victims and in some cases cannibalizing them, but it's usually a, pers a progressive uh, sort of development from straightforward killing at the beginning to far more bizarre and ritualistic uh, killing near the end. It's also possible the killers were trying to destroy evidence of their crimes and were too stupid to realize they were actually preserving them. These bodies looked sort of like mummified. As far as I can tell, the wrong acid was used because the bodies were put into barrels of hydrochloric acid, which does not so easily dissolve human tissues. Had they been put into sulfuric acid, there would be much more damage. The gruesome discovery is the moment of truth. It's time for police to move in. Their plan of attack for the day, which included the arrest of John Bunting, Robert Wagner, and Mark Hayden. Three separate uh, squads were sent out with two groups each, a search group and an arrest group. The first house that was uh, visited was John Bunting's house. He was arrested along uh, briefly with Elizabeth Harvey. And they were taken uh, to the police station. Uh, Bunting was later charged with one count of murder. Around the same time Robert Wagner was arrested and he was taken to uh, to the police station and tra later charged with one count of murder, as was Mark Hayden. That afternoon, the three men are charged with the murder of a person unknown. Jamie Blasakis is questioned a few days later. Blasakis is interviewed by police and he rolls over. Over six days, he tells them all he knows, hoping to get immunity for his crimes. Jamie leads police to where the bodies of Ray Davies and Suzanne Allen are buried at Waterloo Corner Road. As news breaks of the grisly discoveries, detectives struggle to explain to the world's media the daunting task they're now facing. Uh, the, the difficulty we have is that we haven't really uh, identified the victims and so we can't say for any certainty uh, when they were last seen and when in fact they may have died. We have located uh, several quite large plastic bags. Now, it's much too early to confirm as to um, uh, how many bodies that might be there. Never before in the history of South Australia has the challenge been so great to investigate a series of crimes as a single event. It is becoming fairly evident that we will now have to resort to uh, uh, DNA profiling uh, to uh, identify the rest of the people. Police identify 10 bodies, but they're yet to discover Clinton Trezise and Thomas Trevelyan are also victims. Eventually, Bunting, Wagner and Hayden were charged with 10 counts of murder and Vosakis was charged with 5 counts of murder. When the four men appear before a magistrate, it's obvious that there's tension between them. Vlasakis is becoming quite distressed as the other three taunt him during witness evidence. Court officials are forced to intervene and from now on, Vlasakis will remain under guard and separated from his tormentors for the duration of the lengthy committal hearing. Jamie's mother, Elizabeth Harvey, dies of cancer before she can take part in any of the proceedings. Jamie decides he can now tell the whole truth. Towards the end of that uh, 
committal hearing after the death of Jamie Vasakis's mother. Vasakis no longer had a reason to protect his mother and felt able to plead guilty to the murders and turn evidence. This he did and he was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment with 26 years non-parole. He then became the, the, the Crown star witness at the trials of John Bunting, Robert Wagner and Mark Hayden. Bunting, Wagner and Hayden are tried in the South Australian Supreme Court on 12 counts of murder. All three at first denied the charges, but eventually Robert Wagner, in the face of overwhelming evidence, pleads guilty to three murders. John Bunting and Mark Hayden maintain their innocence. Wagner's Supreme Court trial is interrupted when three jurors refuse to continue and withdraw because of the horror of the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> of the 12 counts, they uh, convicted John Bunting of 11 counts and uh, Wagner of seven to add to the three he had already pled guilty to before the trial. So, almost 11 months after it begins, the longest criminal trial in South Australia's history comes to an end. But Justice Martin has one last task. That comes six weeks later, when Bunting and Wagner appear before him for sentencing. After accusing them of being cowards, having killed for pleasure, and noting that they'd shown no remorse at all, Justice Martin glares at them in the dock and sentences them to life. The Supreme Court dismissed a final appeal by Bunting and Wagner in May 2005. The murder charges against Hayden were dropped when he finally pleaded guilty to assisting in the killings of his wife Elizabeth Hayden and Troy Ude. He was sentenced to 25 years jail with a non-parole period of 18 years. Well done, John, you've done it again, mate. John Justin Bunting. Life with no parole date set. Robert Joe Wagner. Life, no parole date set. <laughs> Jamie Spiridon Vlasakis. Life, parole only after 26 years. Mark Ray Hayden. 25 years, parole only after 18. The judge tells Bunting and Wagner, if I had the power to make an order that you never be released, I would unhesitatingly make that order. I think he's unredeemable. I think I might have actually seen the closest thing to the devil in Australia. He's gone. The blackest person Australia may have ever known. The people of Snowtown are also Bunting and Wagner's victims. The name of their small rural community will forever be synonymous with Australia's worst serial killings, even though it was only the brief final setting in the terrible saga. With the monsters locked away, all that's left is the grief and suffering of the friends and relatives of the victims. I do get nightmares and I do still uh, have some <coughs> recurring thoughts about what's happened and what's gone down. It's amazing how I can go about every day living and there'll be something just so trivial and it will just rush certain things back. I try very hard to put it back and take it to the back of my brain. I try not to dwell on the, the, the things because it just becomes too much for me to handle.